Hello, 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 everyone. This is your friend Vivek Bajaj from Stockage and Elon Markets. Friends, I welcome you to yet another Face to Face Global. And this is very, very special. And I'm sure this is going to be the amazing, amazing interaction you are going to learn from. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bit nervous today, but I'm sure that uh, this nervousness will vanish in no time. Uh, I have someone who, is, um, who has been there, done that. And today, in global arena, he's a big name. He is doing some incredible work in the domain of cryptocurrencies and et cetera. Uh, so guys, uh, first time I'm recording something on crypto side and uh, I've learned so much uh, while I had to record something with him. I had to do my preparations. And in that process, I've learned so much about this asset class. So we are going to have a lot of queries, soft as well as hard queries. So let me, uh, before I welcome the guest, let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, the name of the guest is Raul Pal. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision Group, and he's a global macro investor. He has a company with the name of Global Macro Investor. Raul Pal is highly respected in the world of finance and more so in the world of cryptocurrencies. His profile reads that he pride himself on being a business cycle economist, investment strategist, and economic historian. Oh my God, this is one of those uh, uh, profile which is like, I want my kids to become like him one day for sure. So, you know, let me welcome Raul Paul in this discussion. Hello, how are you doing? Fantastic. Great to be here. Really looking forward to this. I, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And you know what? Um, uh, when I when I first thought that I'll do this with you, then obviously my preparation has to be world class, not ordinary. So I thank you for doing this because at least I've been pushed to read about cryptos and what's happening in this new world. Thank you. Good. Oh, finally, we have to get you across the line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so all right. So you know the format of face to face is that uh, I. Uh, so the reason why I do face-to-face -face is predominantly to inspire people, inspire to, uh, by getting to know about the life of the person. And uh, everyone has challenges in their life and they have overcome those challenges to reach where they have reached. So that is inspiring. And the other one is obviously to push people towards learning. So we want to hear your story first. Uh, I'm so excited about one more thing that you have spent some time for your schooling in Calcutta, which is like uh, amazing, amazing feeling. So please tell me about you. How did you reach where you are? And then we get into the questions which I have for you. Yeah, so I grew up in England. My father is Indian. He was first generation, moved over to England in the 1950s, as many Indians did. My mother was from Holland and they met on a blind date in Birmingham in England. Um, I um, grew up just outside of London. And when I was 11 years old, we decided to move to Calcutta, uh, where I attended Calcutta International School for about 18 months or so. Had a fantastic time. I've been going to India my whole life. Um, moved back to the UK. Um, and then I did pretty well in school. But then I kind of discovered girls and cars and all of the things, you know, at like 16, 17 years old. And I only got into, I only got offered one university place which was the only place that accept me. And I did a degree in economics and law, not a great university. Um, and I eventually kind of pulled through, focused on my studies, got through, and then graduated directly into a recession where there's no jobs. Oh, my, my God. Right. <laughs> so um, I was speaking to a friend of my father's at the time, and he said, you know, Raoul, what is it that you want to do? And I said, well, my father was in marketing. So I thought, yeah, maybe marketing, maybe working for an FMCG marketing firm like Mars or something like that. Or I wanted to go into finance because this was 1990. The 1980s was where finance exploded onto the scene. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, the era of Gordon Gecko and Wall Street and all of that. And I thought, wow, I fancy that. And the guy looked at me and said, it's a very easy choice, Ralph. I said, what's the how? He said, well, you can go and work for Mars and get free Mars bars, or you can go and work for a bank and get free money. Okay. <laughs> it, it, was, it was one of those moments thought, yeah, okay, if I can do that. Problem was there were no jobs. So I still have today, uh, hidden in a drawer somewhere, 130 rejection letters from every single investment bank and asset management firm, but I persevered. 
Um, and I got in through the back door. I worked for a company called Dow Jones Tellerate, which is kind of like Bloomberg of, of this age. Okay. Um, and I started training people in technical analysis for one of their products. Then eventually got offered a job working for a very prestigious UK brokerage firm. Um, and I was a salesman in equities and equity derivatives. Oh. So futures options. And from that, I started my career. Um, I found that, you know, as anybody entering into financial markets, it's very difficult. I mean, there's prices moving and you don't know why they're moving or what they mean or anything. And people talk about economic data and you're like, I don't understand any of this. So different people make sense of the world in different ways. And I'm a visual person. And I started realizing that the technical analysis that I've been taught and was teaching people yeah. was my window into the world. I can look at any market, any asset, understand its price history, the sentiment, the behavior of the market participants, and maybe probabilities of how things might play out going forwards. Right. Because people tend to react the same way to, diff to the same or different kind of events. So I use charts. And so charts gave me this visual view of the world. And then I started, this was the early 90s and the rise of the hedge funds. And these hedge funds were like the gunslinging, most famous people in the world. George Soros breaking the Bank of England, Julian Robertson at Tiger, um, Paul Tudor Jones. And I saw these guys and I started speaking to some of them. But it was when I changed firm that one of those moments happened. Them, you know, we make our own luck and luck also happens. Yeah. But I was joining this new UK investment bank, NatWest. And I was going to be running the international equity derivatives business out of Europe. And I arrived, I've moved the whole team across from HSBC and moved the whole team across. And my first day, suddenly I've got a new boss, not the yeah. boss that had hired me. <laughs> and he said, listen, Raoul, 120 people from Morgan Stanley have just joined NatWest in equity derivatives. And we're going to try and be the leading investment bank in the world in this market. But the problem is, is your job doesn't exist anymore because we want to break it, break it down and do other stuff. I'm like, oh, God, this is trouble. And he said, so what do you want to do? I had already made my, a name for myself starting to get to know hedge funds, but only a small amount. I said, listen, I want to be the hedge fund guy. I like how they think. I see the world in this big picture macro view like they do. And most of them use charts as well as understanding economies and understanding sentiments and flows and all the things that I did. So he said, fine, who do you want to speak to? And I gave him a list of the 10 largest hedge funds in the world. I said, well, those, I'm like, these is my clients. He said, fine, come to New York next week. I'll introduce you to all of them. Wow. And then I started my career as like the leading hedge fund salesperson in Europe to all of these hedge fund giants. So I built a big business at NatWest. Um, I got to know Paul Tudor Jones, Lewis Bacon, Stan Druckenmiller, all of the legends of the industry, because I was the guy in Europe that they would speak to. Um, then I got a call one day from a partner of Goldman Sachs who ran equity derivatives. Well, a Bloomberg message saying, I'd like you to come start the hedge fund business here at Goldman Sachs. Wow. So that was the leading investment bank in the world, bar none. Um, this is a firm that I could never get into because my grades weren't good enough and I didn't go to the right university. I didn't go to Harvard, didn't go to Oxford. Um, and so I joined Goldman uh, after 19 interviews. Um, and that was pretty good because normally it's about 27 interviews. They barely hired anybody from the outside world. They only took people who they had hired from their graduate program. I, given that opportunity, I knew I had the best opportunity I'd, I could ever be given, which is the best name in the world, the hedge fund business, which was exploding in size. And I already knew the customer base. So I built a very big business there. Um, I was lucky to be there over the Asian crisis that if anybody goes back and looks at the Asian crisis, this was 1997, 98, yeah. when South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, all of these countries completely fell apart in a debt crisis. Mm. And so I traded my first proper crisis and learn how the world really works and how you apply macroeconomics to markets, the big picture views. Then it was 1999 and we had the internet boom and I knew that it was going to end in a bust and a recession was coming. So I wanted to go to the other side of the fence and become a hedge fund manager. 
Okay. So one of my customers, my biggest customer, GLG Partners, which is the biggest hedge fund firm in Europe, yeah. said, look, come here and start. So we started a global macro hedge fund um, and I traded the recession in 2000, 2001, um, 2002, did extremely well. Um, and then eventually decided by about 2004 that I'd had enough of running money um, for other people because it's very stressful. You know, mm. all day, all night, you're worried about your P&L. You know, what are your investors going to say? Are you going to get this right? You don't sleep a lot. I thought, you know, I want to do something different. So I decided to opt out of the rat race, move to the Mediterranean coast of Spain and start using my 20 years of experience at that point to write macroeconomic research for the world's biggest hedge funds, family offices, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. So that's Global Macro Investor, which I started then. Okay. That's been going for 17 years. Um, and then in that journey as well, I saw and forecast the 2008 crisis and the European crisis in 2012. But re what really unsettled me, what defined the second phase of my life, was that people came up to me and said, why didn't we know? Hmm. And I thought, well, there's a bunch of us at the center of the financial system who knew it all. And we profited from it. And ordinary people got destroyed by it. Yep. And I thought, it's not right. I should do something about this. So I went on two journeys. One, I thought, well, there's too much debt in the financial system. And I should maybe go and start a safe bank. Because we've just seen things like in Cyprus, everybody's money was taken out of their bank accounts. Sure. And I'm like, this is terrifying. So I started that journey. And that journey led me to somebody tapping me on the shoulder and said, forget about that look at Bitcoin. That was 2012 or 13. And I started doing the work into Bitcoin and I bought it first in 2012, 13, wrote the first ever macro strategy paper about Bitcoin, how to value it uh, back then. And that became quite a famous article. The other part of my journey is I wanted to reach more people. So I thought the written medium was not the future and the video medium was the future. And and um, I could reach more people by video. And what I needed to do is give everybody access to the same incredible thinkers that the hedge funds and everybody else got access to. So what we did was interview, like this, the world's best investors, hedge fund managers, analysts, strategists, gave them an hour, not the three-minute soundbite from CNBC, yeah. but an hour of in-depth conversation so, we, so people could learn. Um, and that was the start of Real Vision. So crypto and real vision were my two solutions to, okay, we know we're in a different world and that's what moving forwards. And so that's been the journey since then. Amazing, amazing. I think this capsule, I'm going to cut it and I'm going to send it to all the business schools of our country and tell them, play this. And you know when the student is coming and getting the admission done, because this is such a dream come true journey, what you have gone through. Tell me one thing before I ask, uh, you know, more technical questions. How to make money in bear market? It's so easy to make money in bull market. How do we prepare ourselves for bear market and still make money in bear market? So I actually make more money by a long way in bear markets. So bear markets for macro people tend to be very interesting. So if you think about a bull market, they tend to be long. Mm. And let's say they go up 10% a year. Okay. okay or 15% a year, something like that. That takes a long time. Bear markets, you probably get a 50% return in a six month period. Yeah. So with the ability to use futures or options, particularly options, you can take hugely leveraged bets in a very fast moving market where the markets have underpriced this risk. So that is where when you're looking at the indicators, particularly around recessions, it's hard around geopolitical events and stuff because they tend to be more randomized. But recessions tend to be forecastable. And around that, you can start positioning yourself. So we're starting to see it happening in the US right now. We're starting to see the yield curve turning lower. Yep. Usually when the yield curve goes negative, a recession follows soon after. So then you're looking for business cycle indicators like the ISM survey or PMI surveys or sentiment surveys to start rolling over 
and going below 50 it is in the ISM, which tells you the economy started to potentially co contract. Those kind of signals, and then a bit of technical analysis will give you the timing. Now, it's, there's, not, there's no 100%, there's no certainties in this world. All we do as investors is look for putting probabilities in our favor. Okay. And the more experience you have doing that, the better you get at it. And you know, the, the pandemic was one of those very obvious setups for us in the macro world. The economies globally were already slowing down. We'd had the trade tariff wars with China and the US. Trade was slowing down. Then the pandemic arrives. You saw the outcome in China, which was lock everything down. It went to Italy. Italy did the same. The moment that happened, you knew the whole world was going to follow suit and close their economies. And that looked like, OK, this is a macroeconomic event that we can not only hedge ourselves from, but actually profit from. OK, so I mean, just want to extend this discussion further that, you know, when we are making prediction of a bear market, then obviously we can't be right most of the time. So if I have to get a ballpark number from you that say out of 10 times you have predicted or 100 times you may have predicted bear market, how many times actually it has worked? Because when it works, it really works well and it gives you so much money, but you tend to get wrong as well. And there is a stop loss I'm sure you have, which uh, because you go went wrong, you will trigger, let the stop loss get triggered. So the, what's the ballpark percentage of success in predicting the bear so, market? So there, are the, 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 there is a secret here. There are, there are two types of drawdowns that you get. You get corrections and you get economic bear markets. Okay. Right now, across the world, we've seen, been seeing markets sell off. Well, if we go back to my framework, the ISM is still positive. Global growth is still positive. Yes, it's rolling over. Yes, the yield curve's coming, but none of the economic signals are there. Okay. So really... You have you you have to be quite lucky to capture those events. Yeah, and I would say I probably get you know it's a very 50-50 hit rate, maybe less. Okay. Percent of those kind of corrections you can spot. They tend to be technical analysis, but you often have many false starts, and then finally it happens, and I, they're not great. If you get the other one, which is all the economic signals stack up then I have a 100% hit rate. Sure. No, that's 100% would be fair. I'm always early. So give me maybe get stopped out once, give it a go once, maybe even a second time, but the third time you make all the returns. So you might, you know, lose 2%, lose 3%, make 30, 40%. You know, it's, 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 you know, thinking of the risk returns, but just picking market corrections, unless you're a really good trader, mm -hmm. I tend to be slightly longer term. I tend to be, six months to two years is my time horizon. Um, we, our ego wants us to pick all of these because it makes yeah. you feel right. Bears always sound smarter. And I've been a bear, you know, a lot of the time. But realistically, you're better off to buy the dips than to sell the rallies. And India is a market where I have waited for a, pull, a full structural bear market for 15 years. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, because of the demographics and flow of funds in India and international interest in India, you just never get that opportunity that you're really looking for. Because before you know it, the flow of funds comes back in. It's a very young population. People are investing there for their retirement. Um, so, yeah, it's hard. I would never pick tops in India. That's a dangerous game. I'd pick bottoms. Every time you get a sell-off, that's the opportunity. All right. So that's uh, good to hear about it. And now that we are talking about India, I want to talk to you about uh, a macro change which has been seen in India, which is digitalization. And especially, you know, financialization of saving, digitalization. It's a huge thing in India right now, and you have been tracking it. So how do you connect uh, these two, the onboarding of new gen products? Like, I mean, every millionaire in India is talking about crypto, NFTs and the digitalization wave which is happening in India. So how do you connect these two? So after the financial crisis, and after particularly the European crisis in 2012, you started to hear central banks talking about um, the need for kind of some form of digital payments, getting rid of cash. Yeah. 
right? getting rid of cash became a big thing. Yeah. Then Modi got rid of the large notes and introduced this whole kind of system of Aadhaar and UPI, India stack, and, and banned the large rupee notes, the old ones, to try yeah. and get the money out of the black economy. I remember seeing everybody in uproar. This is terrible. What they're doing is spying on the people. And I'm like, well, India A needs to have more tax collection if it wants to build the roads and the bridges and the, you know, all of the systems that it needs to develop. But secondly, I saw this immediately as, oh my God, this is so positive because I knew India well, and it was a terrible, terrible banking system. Yep. Awful way of payments. It was, didn't work. And now suddenly India had leapfrogged the world with what it had done. Yes, other countries um, have done similar, China, et cetera, but India was highly unlikely to do something like this, yeah, suddenly yeah. did. And I saw this as incredibly bullish. Now, as you know, Indians tend to be pretty technical. They're good at computer programming, mathematics, et cetera. It's cultural. So here you've got people previously who were working for foreign multinationals or outsourcing now being given this fintech revolution in India. Because what was genius about both UPI and Aadhaar and that whole India stack, they were saying, build on top of it. Yep. And so what you're now doing is giving Indians an opportunity in their home country to start building these new businesses. And so many amazing businesses have started being built on top of this. So now anybody, you know, the average age in India is still below 30. Mm. So what you've got is a group of people who now, since their early 20s, know nothing but digitization. So cryptocurrency is an obvious thing, because India, A, has always struggled with a weakening currency over time. So yep. people are looking for something Indians like gold, because they understand the value over time as a store of value. So crypto has an easy narrative, but Indians are very digitally native. So here is something that's kind of mathematical, kind of computer-like, plays on the digitization of the world that they've seen firsthand, much more than somebody in the US or me in the Cayman Islands. So for me, it was obvious that India would be a big crypto market. It was then just all about the regulation because governments always fear it because India's always feared capital flight because of the weakening rupee. Yep. But realistically, if India gets this right, as it's been getting most things right, things like Reliance Industries have been making, you know, I think they're going to be, if not the largest, one of the largest com companies in Asia. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a trillion dollar company because of what they're doing is building the, the, the digital applications layer for everything. And they own the phone networks and, you know, green energy and all of these other things that they're building. I think money is going to flood into India if they allow cryptocurrencies and technology and India's advantage in the world, which is so many smart people and a relatively low cost of, of, of labor in a, on the world stage, you will attract capital. Capital won't leave. And I think, you know, the governments are still always looking a little bit in the past. But, you know, this is, a, I think, a once in a lifetime opportunity where, yes, look, a lot of people aren't happy with Modi. I get it. But there are some really big steps that have happened that could not have happened without somebody who was that forceful. So, you know, they come with good and bad. True, true that. So you talked about currency weakness and you talked about relevance of crypto. I mean, my audience is obviously very naive about these things. So maybe I'll ask you some stupid questions also. So kindly pardon my ignorance and I'll ask you basic questions as well. When you say currency getting weak, I mean, that's the structure of our uh, you know, interest rate regime that uh, on a long term basis, our currency will become weak, right? How does a crypto uh, helps our currency? The government is what is the concern of the government that we will lose control and crypto is not regulated or not, we don't know what will happen. And that's why they want to protect uh, the local currency. So based on the case studies or any examples we have outside, how will a cryptocurrency protect the local currency? So usually when you have currency weakness, you have higher inflation. And yeah. India's always had relatively high inflation. Over time, it's been coming down. Yeah. And 
you know, demographically speaking, it should get lower. And we've seen interest rates in India trend lower over the last 20 years. Yeah. Much like they have in the rest of the world, but they're still higher than the rest of the world. So, but inflation has been generally higher than you see in, in, in the West. And that's one of the reasons is because you import oil price, you import yeah. oil and yeah. raw material. India doesn't have many raw materials. It has intellectual capital. That's it's probably its biggest thing. So if you think of the falling rupee, each rupee buys less oil. Yeah. So the, the price of oil goes up. Yeah. So how do you offset that as an as a saver? How do you offset that? Well, what's interesting is cryptocurrencies are international products and they tend to be anchored in limited supply. So Bitcoin has only 21 million Bitcoins that ever be created. So you have a digitally scarce asset, kind of like gold, but it fits in this new digital India world where you know all of these things can connect easily. People are used to wallets and transactions and those kind of things. So it allows you to put savings in something that doesn't get devalued over time for inflation yeah. or falling. So that is that, but it also is another thing, which is basically it's a call option on this new technology blockchain. So you're getting this store of value, which is very useful for Indians because of this issue with the currency, but you also buying this call option in the future of blockchain technology and Indians of all people should be able to see the future of digitization. Everything is being digitized and money and all of the the infrastructure rails of the financial system and the internet is all going on blockchain. All right. Uh, so well, let's consider that crude oil example that we are net importer of crude oil because of our energy needs. Now, will we see a situation where uh, for India to purchase crude oil, we will be also able to pay to all these oil suppliers in, uh, in some kind of a cryptocurrency so that uh, the benefit of that appreciation in crypto cryptocurrency value actually gets accrued to our country? Well, the only way you do that is for the central bank uh, to have it on their balance sheet. Yeah. Could they in the future? Possibly. There are some um, central banks that are already doing so or sovereign right. wealth funds that are doing so. Um, so it's possible, but that's not going to come. And it depends, do does the oil producer, whether it's Iran or whether it's Russia or whoever you're buying your oil from, do they want it in, in Bitcoin? Do you have the Bitcoin? I don't know. Um, so really, it's about the individual or the corporation finding a way of hedging against these inflationary costs. OK, so it's actually pretty interesting for, let's say, an oil refiner to have Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Because it, the value of their of, in their treasury is maintained in purchasing power, while their rupee balances are worth less versus the price of oil. Let's say, okay. so so there are some for individuals and corporations. Interesting for the government, I think it's one step too far right now. All right. So because crude oil is also a finite resource, can they actually think of launching a crypto against that finite resource? and then make well, it a publicly tradable currency? Well, the issue is with crude oil is what's interesting about cryptocurrencies is they're programmed. So you know the exact supply. OK, OK. With crude oil, you discover shale. Suddenly, there's massive new amounts of oil. OK. Or Saudi Arabia finds a new oil field. So it doesn't, it doesn't work in the same way. But, you know, arguably the system that we've been in for the last 50 years is the petrodollar system it's yeah. you know we buy the u.s buys oil from the large um oil producing nations in dollars yeah so the world gets dollarized in return they then buy u.s treasury bonds yeah with their dollars because they want to keep dollars and the u.s kind of financially dominates the world the petrodollar system has essentially been that yeah 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 Great. So you talked about blockchain technology and how everything in future is going to be around that. So, you know, can I uh, you know, ask you very basic questions, although I understand the definition that it's kind of a chain, which is you can't disturb that chain and it's much more secure. But can we take one practical example apart from crypto? 
uh, some other example of blockchain where there is clearly a real life application of blockchain which is there and which is adding value so it's happening everywhere so if you you need to understand how the crypto space is yeah these cryptocurrencies like bitcoin particularly ethereum and others solana avax luna these are the blockchains on which the applications are built okay they're not the applications themselves but they are networks blockchain networks that if we buy the token we're participating in the network so okay. if you imagine that facebook the network owners are the people who own the shares we as users of whatsapp or facebook we just get the utility but we don't get any value right this new world of cryptocurrencies users have a token so it goes up in value so everybody's a participant an economic participant in the network but that's that they're called layer ones after that is the applications layer so the first thing that really came out was decentralized finance yeah so again to equate it to the indian world this is fintech but fintech that's not being done by the banks or a small startup it's fintech that is that is decentralized in nature so algorithms matching flows and get creating yields and all sorts of incredible stuff that just happens by algorithms mm. and it becomes and some are centralized some are decentralized but this is the basically the yield the borrowing and lending layer the, 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 that fintech layer so that's building massively so that's our banking system where i can now have my crypto i can get paid a five percent interest um or i can lend it to you i can do other things with it or i can swap it for something else all of the the functions the banks provide us but yep. there's no middleman we're not paying the bank the next big thing that came out last year was non-fungible tokens nfts yeah this at first people don't understand because it's like well people are trading pictures it, digital pictures and they're going for millions of dollars this is ridiculous yes and no what this is is a non-fungible token versus a fungible token a fungible token is one bitcoin is the same as another bitcoin but there's a finite supply okay those bitcoins are the network layer or the let's say ethereum it's a better example ethereum is the network layer on top of that, on this chain that records everything, distributed, so no, so there is always one source of truth, which is all of the nodes on the network confirm that that what's in that that um, block is yep. correct. So on top of that, you can have a non fungible token. What that is is it's a unique token for a unique contract. So smart contracts are what Ethereum brought to the world. Okay. And that allows you to put a very individual thing. So let's say you're a famous digital artist. You can now create scarcity by saying, well, I'm going to make an NFT of my art. So this is exactly the same as you can have a set of limited edition prints, or you can have the original. So, or you can have the image you've just taken off Google because you want to have it as your screensaver. The one that has value is the original. And then the next value is the scarce supply limited edition prints. So that's what you're doing here, but there's no middlemen okay. because now you can, you can start selling art to people, but it gets a lot bigger than this. Yeah. So property can be attached to the blockchain now. So think of the mess that is Bombay property by some of the people, the title deeds that are owned by 28 families and the, all of this issue of redeveloping. None of that has to happen. If you think of a property transaction as well, you need a notary to confirm the two parties have made this agreement that needs to be lodged. Yep. Within that, as you know, there's bribery and corruption that takes place. There's difference of prices. There's all of these things. And then when I want to buy that property, because you've just bought it, I want to buy it from you. Do I know your title deeds? Who really owns it? All of these things are complicated. If you put property on a blockchain, it's all confirmed. All the legal contracts, it's essentially 
notarized by every participant on the chain. So it means that we have trust. And a digital world where everything moves so fast, we need trusted things. We don't want to go to the notary every time and then get three lawyers involved and then go to the bank. We want it all to be trusted instantaneously, which is kind of like India stack, right? So now you can do your KYC instantaneously. Well, imagine if the whole world does that on blockchain, then everything is interoperable. We can do this all together. And NFTs are unleashing all sorts of things we don't know. Just think of every contract. So insurance will go onto NFTs because you yeah. have these new, and then we can sell insurance and buy insurance and trade insurance, all sorts of things. It's like the derivative market is clearly going to go onto blockchain because it's a much better way of keeping track of who owns what and all of these things. Um, and same with the credit markets as well. So there's a lot and it's only just started and we're going to see even more developments coming in all of these things. All right. Uh, so uh, can I just uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So basically uh, there is a network of nodes and uh, say you have a coin against that, say Bitcoin. So when you are essentially owning a Bitcoin, you're actually literally owning that network. Can I, can I make that presumption? Some you're piece owning, of that network? You're owning a piece of the 21 million Bitcoins that make up the final full network. Oh, so right. if the network has value, this is called Metcalfe's law. So Metcalfe's law is how you think about networks. So if you think about, um, I'll relate it to reliance in a sec. If you think about Ethereum as a network or Bitcoin, yeah. you have the people who buy it, the owners of the network. So people who are trading it, whatever, they own a piece of the network. But the network to be really valuable, you want people to build applications and connect all of these people together. So if you relate it back to reliance, so if we think what um, Ambani first did, which was he took over the entire mobile phone market, but started at 3G or 4G. Yeah. So that put everybody else out of business. So what he did was make data free, essentially. So he's now got a network, but we haven't created value in the network yet. So normally you would have gone bankrupt. But what he then did is raised $10 billion from Google, Facebook, and everybody else and said, right, I'm going to build all the applications layer, the shopping, the online shopping, the, all of the uses of his network. So then now he owns the network and he owns the application layer. That is incredibly valuable. You are clearly realized bull, clearly, clearly. Huge, huge bull. <laughs> so is the case with me. So yeah, so coming to the fair value of that network or Bitcoin or any, any uh, crypto we are talking about. So how do you give a value to these assets? which are so futuristic that you don't know what can be built on top of that and how much add-on value these things can generate in future. Yeah, so this is, this is the hard part. It's the same with any technology company. Is it going to get adoption? So this whole world is all about Metcalfe's law. Now, there's no easy Metcalfe's law, just plug it into my computer and it gives me a fair value. Right? So you have to estimate it. And you're estimating it by looking at, is the network growing? Are people building things on it? So you, you make some forecast, on, forecast based on that. So mm. like you'll see tokens like Shiba Inu, that retail are trading. And you have to ask yourself, is that really a network or is that just a speculation? Now, in most cases like that, it's just speculation. That's fine. People want to speculate, do what, do what they want. But you're not going to build long-lasting value. So over time, they trend to zero. But what's interesting was the other one like that was Dogecoin, which was this joke crypto that everybody found as a meme and they liked it. It was kind of fun and that big and it's kind of a bit weird. But a lot of people invested in it. And so this was looking like it was a potential disaster in the making. But then Mark Cuban, a famous US investor who owns the Dallas Mavericks, um, which is a um, Dallas basketball team that's pretty famous and he's a very famous guy he said you know what if you guys all own it we're just going to accept it as payments for anything to do with the Dallas Mount and then Elon Musk said well if you guys love this we're going to use it too so I think Tesla's going to end up 
using it. And so now what you're creating is the applications layer. So you don't always know, so you need to be aware. Ethereum, very straightforward. Everything's happening there. Yeah. The network's growing, applications learn. So, okay, so how does the average person figure out if this is working? And there's an easy hack. So go back to the charting, my technical analysis. All of these assets, these digital assets, um, Metcalfe's law is exponential in nature. So it means when you draw a linear chart, it always looks like this. Yeah, yeah. Most people go, it's a bubble. It's yeah. an endless thing. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. And you would have done the same with Reliance. You would have done the same with Google, Facebook, Tesla, all of these. And you would have got them wrong every time because these were network stocks. So what you do to value a network stock is change the scale on your chart to log scale. Okay. And then what happens is magic. Most of them end up being in this beautiful channel. Right. And they go up and down in the channel. That channel can be 50% because it's log scale. Yeah. But the channel essentially shows you network adoption. Okay. It's a good estimate. So right now, if you take the chart of Facebook since inception, put it on a weekly or monthly chart on a log scale, it's actually breaking its log channel. So what it's saying, and this is another important thing when you're analyzing technological investments and in crypto, is something called the S-curve. These are risky assets, which is why they have so much return, but they're yeah. risky. They can yeah. also go to zero. And the S-curve is the classic moment when this new technology gets tested by the market or by the users. And they either it either survives it, and in which case you get the Lindy effect, which means it strengthens the value of the network, or it fails. You know, most startups fail. So if we look at Amazon, Amazon had a very big S-curve in 2001-2. After the tech crash, most things were going to zero. Amazon was still a bookseller. And everyone was like, should a bookseller survive this? And it fell 95% but it didn't go bust and then it recovered and it started having these waves and the waves were, you know, suddenly it was trading on a P of 800 and people like me were like, this is ridiculous. It's a bubble. What we didn't realize is the market had started to figure out that it was more than just a bookseller. It could have the opportunity, the probability of becoming a massive online retailer that starts happening. Then the market starts saying, well, it's an online retailer. It'll never beat Walmart. And then it comes out with AWS, the cloud server. And before you knew it, these S curves get smaller and smaller. Yeah. And so what we've got in Facebook right now is an S curve because people are getting fed up with Facebook itself as a product. Yeah. The company, how it uses your data, how it monetizes you, the network slowing down, it's TikTok and other things. I know you've got some in India that are growing super fast. So Facebook's feeling the threat. But people aren't listening. What Facebook has said is we are pivoting entirely away from this social media model to a metaverse model. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't like that. So they want to sell it. They say Facebook's lost its way. The entire bet on Facebook is are we oversold in that logarithmic channel? Is this S curve the death of Facebook and the death of that network? Or is the market mispricing the new opportunity? And that's what you have to do with this. So logarithmic charts, and if you can do, I don't know what uh, what uh, charting products can use regression channels, but I find they're really useful. Yep. So you can see, usually they go within the one or two standard deviations over bought or oversold. Facebook's currently three standard deviations oversold. Really interesting to me. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, you said uh, in the initial part of the discussion that in India, we are used to uh, looking at history and uh, we have a kind of a denial mode for things which have not been part of the history. So if you see this model, which you are suggesting is so futuristic and no one has seen this in India. So we are like that. Uh, how can something with a, for example, I mean, I don't want to mention company's name, but still for the sake of argument, we have Paytm, which got listed with a, with a, I mean, negative P literally, right? No earning, but still listed and listed a very high valuation. So for us Indians, 
it's a it's a non accepted thing that how can a loss making enterprise get value but it does and obviously paytm has lost the value but then there are other startups who have gained a lot of value in them because so it's, it's uh, is the network going to be valuable because if yeah. paytm really got it right it could be an enormous business so if you think of its valuation as just a probability of future success yeah. in these technology stocks, and that's why you're, you're happy to pay for something that has negative earnings if you can ascribe a probability of something much larger. And then you need to figure out is the probability, is the price now expensive or cheap versus the future probability? Sure, sure. So crypto, uh, you know, Bitcoin, it corrected by almost, I think, 50% or so. so I'm asking a straight question. Is it a buy on dip or what is it like? I mean, if, if you believe that it's a huge network, then, and I, I got this answer actually through this logarithmic answer, which you gave that looking at that channel, obviously it may look like it's a buy on dip, but how to manage that nerve of seeing something which is 50% down? So as you know, being a trader, it's all about position sizing. Yeah. And it's all about risk appetite. If you are 30 years old and you have some savings and you want to take risk because you don't have as much as you'd like for the future, but you've got a good job, go ahead, take the risk. Make a calculated, thoughtful risk, not just buying an option and hoping a stock goes up, but if this is your thesis that cryptocurrency is going to go from $2 trillion to $200 trillion, which is my thesis, I think it's the biggest opportunity I've ever seen. And it's going to be the largest wealth accumulation in all history in the shortest period of time. The network adoption currently for crypto is growing twice the speed the internet did with the same number of users. So back in 1998, um, the internet was growing at 63% a year, had about 500 million users. Crypto is about 500 million users now. It's growing at 113% a year, which means it gets to a billion people by next year or the year after. Yeah. So when you, sorry to interrupt in the middle, when you say users, I mean, we are talking about users of crypto as a, as a, as a technology, or we are, we are saying the crypto investors. They're all the same thing. Remember the network is both the user and the application all right. And the investor, right? It's all the same thing, which is why people struggle. It's a speculative asset. It's not the future of finance. Yes, it's all of those things. Right. right. Um, so um, I've lost my train of thought. Well, yes, with crypto, is it a buy here? So, so okay, so we're armed with some macro secular trends, yeah. which is massive network adoption. We're seeing regulation that is not banning of it. We're seeing in India, it's the second largest adoption of any country in the world of this. India is very meaningful in the size of this. We're seeing US, we're seeing everybody moving into this arena. So should we be a buyer of the, of the dips or a seller of the rallies? If we're in a secular trend that is exponential in nature, then a 50% drawdown is a hell of an opportunity. And you can either be slightly risk averse, in which case you put a small portion of your portfolio, because this is a 70 volatility, 70% 70 volatility asset. Yeah. So fine, then put 3%, 5% of your portfolio and treat it like an option. It's not going to go to zero, particularly if it's a big one like Ethereum. So maybe it falls another 50%. So can you lose 2.5% of your portfolio? Fine, that's not a problem. But if you're young and you're into technology and you want to take a bet on the future and you've got a steady job and you can afford to take a bet, go for it. Don't do that if you're 70 years old because, you know, you need your money for retirement. But, you know, we can all we're all allowed to take a few bets in our life um, and for one or two of them to go wrong. You know, we talked about that at the beginning of the interview. That's OK, but that's not wild speculation. That's thoughtful process building, framework building build your investment case, um, look for confirmation and then do it. Awesome. Uh, you know, so I've, I've understood Bitcoin and Ethereum to be very, very honest. And I, I heard you also talking about Ethereum. 
So conceptually, I've been able to understand them, but let's talk about other altcoins. Uh, so, I mean, there are so many, right? Yeah, so uh, let me make it really easy for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Step back from the noise. Anybody can start, can create a coin. Like mm -hmm. anybody can create a startup and say, I'm the new fintech solution for India. Yeah. 99% aren't worth anything. Okay. But some are. Okay, so this is a... This is like VC investing, but you've got big products like Ethereum, which is now like investing in Google 20 years ago, right? Yeah. So why are these other tokens? It's straightforward. Bitcoin is incredibly secure in how it's constructed, which is this um, proof of work. You have to solve the algorithm to, to mine Bitcoin and you, you're protecting the network and it's slow. Um, and it's not very good to use for high input things. Now, people are building layers on top that do that, but basically the world's moved on quite fast, but it's incredibly secure. And it's, it, there's never can be more than 21 million. It's, it's a very understandable, unique thing, but it's a bit slow for some applications. Ethereum, incredibly adaptable. It's an applications layer tool that you can build on. So fantastic. Problem is, is the network is so um, in demand that the fees of using the network are high. All right. So, and also it's still not fast enough for some of the really crazy fast payment systems we need. You know, if we think of the internet of things where yeah. all of the, the, everything digital around us is streaming stuff, we will have streaming payments. Ethereum cannot handle that. So, most of these other what are called layer one chains solve one of two things. They're either faster or they're cheaper, but they all come with a trade-off, which is they're more centralized. So they're less secure. All right. So that, that's basically all of those are solving different things. So then again, we look at them and saying, well, who's using these? What's growing? So we saw a lot of developers building on top of Solana. We're seeing interesting network growth in Terra Luna and AVAX. Those are the three that we've seen. Now, will that last? Because Ethereum's about to go through some changes that should make the network cheaper to use um, and maybe faster. So do we need these other ones? We don't know, but this is what we're, these are the bets we can make is one thing versus another, much like we would in the equity market by saying, you know, we think this company is going to outperform that company. Sure. But, uh, you know, when when we are buying these coins, uh, we are not buying any asset, right? We are buying, uh, are we buying the right to use that uh, uh, that uh, that blockchain or that that We're setup? buying a piece of the network. So don't forget, if the network becomes valuable, you make a fortune. So these are the layer ones. We've also got these DeFi tokens. Again, that's a... That's what your bet is, is with the DeFi token, let's say Aave um, or Uniswap or these things. What all we're saying again is, listen, this fintech solution in you know, your terminology is going to get adoption. So it's like the pay, Paytm thing. Is, mm. is it going to work or not? Is it overvalued? It's exactly the same process. All right. Which is, are people going to adopt the use of this at scale? Yes or no, and that's the bet. Those are the bets we're taking. They're all future style bets. Sure, sure, got it. Uh, you know there are a lot of exchanges who are offering these uh, cryptocurrencies, and uh, one of the question which all retail uh, investor, I mean even me, is today. Suppose if I want to buy, then there is X platform, there is Y platform, and we know no one regulates them. So, what do happen to what does it happen to my money? I mean, if I am buying. Uh, and suppose if they vanish or if I'm buying and they just tell me that this is your ledger and their your account is there. So how who is managing my capital risk? So here's the magic of Bitcoin or crypto, all of crypto. You, you're thinking like somebody who's lived in a banking world. Yeah. But the difference here is you can store these assets and you should yourself. So it's called cold storage. There are little devices like a 
Ledger Nano X mm. or a Trezor. And they basically, your coins on the exchange, they may be commingled with other customers, mm. but you transfer it to your wallet, you own it. You'll hear an expression in crypto, not your keys, not your coin. So you own the private keys, they're yours. It's the same as do you keep your gold by gold, you know, do you have certificates or do you physically hold your gold in a safe? Right. So you can do that in crypto at scale and you can trade out of that. Unlike gold, where it's a pain to transfer out of the vault and do this in a little device secures it and you have the keys and nobody else can take it. The world can go bust. There can be the biggest debt crisis on earth and nobody can take that away Um, because it is immutable on the blockchain. So it's one step further, open an account, get used get used to it, do it on exchange. Most of the exchanges are pretty good, you know, but the next stage is, okay, I need to take responsibility for my own security of yeah. my asset. That's okay. But, you know, because we're so used to a financial world where we don't. You know, the poor people in Cyprus, when the government took 90% of their savings out, and same happened in Argentina, it's happened in Lebanon, it happens. That, that kind of stuff, in this new crypto world, can't happen. All right. Uh, I'm I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. I'm learning it, and I think uh, this is this has been a great interaction. I I know you have limitation of time, so you have given me so much time. But I want to ask this last question, because you practice technicals. How is technical analysis uh, with respect to other assets like commodity, currency, equity is different from technical analysis of crypto? Except that obviously it's very volatile. But do you see any other signs of technical analysis working well in this market? It's incredibly well. I mean, most people use technical analysis. Um, it works incredibly well. Um, it depends whether you're a trader. So a lot of traders love crypto because it's volatile. So you've got big swings. So if you like to buy short things, buy things, trade around, it's very good and charts work very well. Um, so because it's you know, all charts are a human behavior. Yeah. <laughs> so all they are. Um, the difficulty with crypto is it's exponential in nature. So most other assets are mean reverting. So things like oil, mean, yeah. mean most commodities are mean reverting. So yeah. once you get high prices, it's met by new supply and the price comes down. Yeah. Um, but these things are exponential. Most equities are quite linear. Yeah. So it's quite hard to get a handle on, which is why you, you're always flipping between the log chart to give you understanding and the traditional chart for the basic technicals. But I use both. I use technicals on the log chart as well. Um, but again, I, I tend to be longer term time horizon. But stuff like this dip here that we've had 50% sounds big, but you put it on a log chart, doesn't look like anything at all. It's like minuscule. And then you start putting the trend channel on that we talked about. And you start thinking, huh, okay, you know, one standard deviation oversold. Does it feel like it should get a two standard deviations or not? Then you start constructing the usual technical analysis, looking for supports to give yourself odds that you're right and a stop loss where you could be wrong. All right. So say if, if I decide that I want to be an investor in crypto, not a trader in crypto. So what should be my technical strategy? What kind of chart duration should I look at? What could be the strategy for me? Yes. So as a investor now, you're basically having to be a VC investor. You're needing right. to decide what basket of, of digital assets do you want to own that you think are going to do well over time. Now, what's the right time horizon for a long-term investor, for a decent investor here? You probably should be three to 10 years. All right. Because we're talking about network adoption at scale that's going to billions of people, right? It's like if you just made a bet on the internet in, in 1999 and then said, well, I'm trading on a six-month time horizon, it doesn't make sense. Or same with mobile phones when they got introduced, right? So you need to think of your time horizon. Um, then you probably want to spread it across a basket. Mm. So the most proven two protocols are obviously Ethereum and Bitcoin. So you're probably heavily overweight those, but you, maybe you want some DeFi and you want some of these layer ones we talked about. And what's different versus VC 
is it's actually liquid. So you can change your mind. In VC, it goes to zero or it goes up um, in venture capital. But this, you can change your mind. Then I would look at the longest time horizon chart that you can. Bitcoin goes back to 2009, eight, um, and um, Ethereum back to about 2015. And you start drawing the biggest charts that you can. Okay. Um, you can use the cycle of Bitcoin and Ethereum to understand where the whole market is. Because the other charts, some of them are only 18 months old. Yeah. So you don't have enough really to give you, but you use the overall market, the bigger tokens to give you an understanding of where we are in the cycle. Um, and then I would, I tend to use, I tend to use very long-term charts, then weekly charts, and daily charts are just used for observation. All right. Because that's when, yeah, that's where all the noise is. I mean, and crypto Twitter and things like that, it's down to hourly charts. I try and, I use the daily chart just to observe and watch what's going on. The weekly chart is the thing that probably drives me to make uh, most of decisions like, do I want to add here? Do I want to reduce here? Awesome. So Raul, this was one of the most enriching conversation I had. And thank you for being my crypto guru and put, putting me into this path of learning this beautiful thing and uh, yet not ready to invest, but I am definitely ready to learn more. And uh, I will keep you informed whenever I do my first investment in crypto. Yeah. And also, you know, I'm passionate about this space. And because of this education hurdle, it's a new thing. Yeah. Is what, that's what, at Real Vision, we started an entirely free crypto channel, which is Real Vision Crypto, realvisioncrypto.com. It's entirely free. Right. All the best people in the world are on it. Um, and that's a great place to learn. Awesome. So, guys, I'm going to send you the link as well below this video. Do visit that channel. And I don't have any commercial relationship with, <laughs> with Raul Red. So, I just want to make this clear that I loved what he does in Twitter. He's a regular writer. I'm following him. And what an amazing person you are. So I'm wishing I'll be in touch with you and learn more from you through virtual as well as through physical world. Thank you. Yeah. If people want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Raul, R-A-O-U-L-G-M-I. Sure. So I will also give that link in a bit uh, below this video. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure interacting with you. Thanks for giving me this time. And I'm looking forward to more learnings from you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.